Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, March 17th. Our special guest is Meredith Akers, and her topics create, not just consume, engaging strategies to demonstrate learning. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. I'm now going to turn the mic over to Peg Volak, who is going to now introduce Meredith and ask her the newbie question. All righty, thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to introduce Meredith Akers today. She is a wife, mom, and elementary school administrator who believes that the best way to help others grow is to model expectations through relationship building, staff developments, meetings, hallway interactions, reflection, technology integration, and application, and instructional practices. Her daily aspiration is to make positive impact and to leave those she serves better off for having interacted with her. Meredith currently serves as assistant principal at Alt Elementary and Cyp Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District outside Houston, Texas. She is a Google Certified Educator, Level 1 and 2, and a Flipgrid Certified Educator. Meredith has led numerous professional development sessions on her campus for her district, at conferences, and as a consultant, including book studies, Google Apps, workshops, and training for school leaders to better utilize tech tools. Meredith is passionate about helping educators connect and grow. She blogs at MeredithAkers.com about educational leadership, ed tech tools and applications, and great instructional practices. In fact, that's where I met her and the power of Twitter um, because adding and connecting with these people can be proven true. You see, I had a snow day back in February and I was reading her blog and I had a question. So I reached out that day and just like that, my question was answered and I did that lesson the following week. She is certainly an inspiration to me. She's an inspiring administrator to follow for sure. I've learned so much. So follow her on Twitter at Meredith Akers. Meredith has so much to offer, so let's get started. We'll begin with the newbie question, Meredith. What role do you think, oh, wait a second, let me, oh, you got it, okay. Sorry, I thought I had to turn the page. <laughs> what role do you think administrators should take as curriculum leader advocating the use of technology? And how do you facilitate this in your school? Well, thank you so much, Peg, for that amazing introduction. Um, and so to answer this question, uh, I think that, number one, administrators should be modeling all the time. And so when I'm leading staff development, when I'm um, sending out emails or even staff meetings, we're flipping staff meetings, where um, I'm using Edpuzzle and different websites as a way to model that use. And then I find that my teachers are on their own going, I could use this in my classroom without me um, telling them because I don't ever want teachers to feel pressured. I want teachers to find things that work for them because everyone has a different teaching personality. And so I don't know how many uh, administrators are logged in right now listening, but even as leaders, I think if you're giving up part of your Saturday to listen to this, you're a leader in education. And so you don't need a title to be a leader. And I think any of us can lead technology use on our campuses by just celebrating when we see other people doing it, modeling it, and just talking about what we're doing that we find successful and why it's successful. Just having those conversations going, I think, is the way to be a great leader and advocating good technology use in the classroom. OK, is it OK for me to go ahead and get started? Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Peggy. Well, today we are going to be talking about create, not just consume, engaging strategies to demonstrate learning so that students aren't just consuming online, but are creating to show their learning. So hello, I am Meredith Akers. As Peg said, I'm an AP at Alt Elementary. This is a little more info about me. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is why. Why should we have students create? The first thing that I want to say is because it should be less about us and more about them. If we're creating a truly student-centered environment, then the students are the ones creating and doing more work. I love this Benjamin Franklin quote that says, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, but involve me and I learn. And then this quote that probably many of you have heard before, the person doing the work 
is the person doing the learning. And so I think a lot of times teachers, educators, curriculum writers, we're doing a lot of work for our students, but even in the classroom time, I think us doing work ahead of time is great, but in the classroom time, who's doing the work? And I want to make sure we are giving students that in-depth time to work and create because that's who's doing the learning. So then if we know all of that, and I think probably most of us could agree on those quotes that I shared and that theory behind the person doing the work is the person doing the learning, so why don't we do it more? Because it feels like there's no time to let students create. Because if we do all of the lecturing and teaching and worksheets first, there isn't time left. So for me, I think it's more about finding ways to get students creating all hands in instead of some of those other things, in, uh, instead of thinking it's got to be in addition to. So let's find ways to use that um, creation part of the class as part of the learning rather than in addition to. So the first thing I want to talk about is using GIFs for learning. Having students create those moving pictures to demonstrate a concept or act out vocab, for example. This is how Peg Volek and I met. First of all, some people say GIF, some people say GIF. It's an age-old question. It's a fight. I personally say GIF like GIFT because GIF stands for Graphics Interchange Format. But there are lots of people who will fight me on this and say it's GIF. No matter how you say it, I just wanted to um, say both are correct. Both are out there. Different people say them different ways. I say GIF. So this is my favorite website that I've found um, to make a GIF with. And on my screen right now, they are not moving. But if you go to my website or in the live binder, if you look at this presentation there, if you're not sure what a GIF is, you'll see that the images move. Like on this page, for example, the little heart is spinning in a circle. So if you're wondering what it is, it's those little moving animations. And a lot of times online or on Twitter, you'll see little clips from a movie to show an explanation. And then they'll be on a loop. Um, so we can actually have our students create these um, at a website that I love called andthenIwasLike.co. And I've got two screenshots, and I, I included these screenshots because this is why I love this site. There's no other stuff to distract our students. There's no um, naughty images. There's no curse words. There's no inappropriate gifts. It's totally clean. So that first um, screenshot at the top that has the purple box around it, when you go to andthenIwasLike.co, this is what you see a blank screen that says, express yourself with gifts using your webcam. Click here to start. You click there to start, and you get the, the pink box screen that I have underneath. That's me, and then there's a record button right in the middle. When you hit record, it allows you or your student to record, and it counts down three, two, one, and then you can record. And then after that, it gives you ways to share it. You can share it to social media, but for my students, I want them to just right click on it and choose download so that they can um, do something with it, like turn it into Google Classroom or turn it into a Padlet, for example. So here's some ideas for use in the classroom with those GIFs. You could challenge students to create a GIF to express the emotions of a character that you're reading about. They could demonstrate a science concept, a science concept, for example, like using manipulatives, they could use a flashlight and some objects to show an eclipse, like this is where the sun should be, this is where the moon should be, and different types of eclipses. You could also have students turn their Chromebook or laptop around and tilt the screen down just enough so that when they're writing on their paper, <coughs> excuse me, so that when they're writing on their paper, you can see how they're working to solve that math problem. Another way this could work is they could hold up a whiteboard to the screen and work out a math problem. But they could also answer a high-level thinking question and use the GIF to show where they found that text evidence. Because I know um, when we're working up towards some state testing, sometimes it's thinking about that text evidence. How do you know the answer? So they could show that. So here's an example that I made, and you can actually steal this. Feel free. I am sharing, so it won't be stealing. Feel free to take this example um, template that I created on my website. But here's an example I made of a template for students to demonstrate um, some vocab words. So I have exuberant definition. They had to write in exuberant means filled with energy and excitement. And then I created a GIF to display that with my facial expressions and body language. So it's not moving right here, but if you go to my website, you can see me moving and excited. And I said, in my GIF, I acted really excited. And I scream and throw my hands up in the air to demonstrate exuberance. 
So this is one example. Um, as Peg mentioned in my introduction, um, she and her students actually used the same template, and she shared some examples with me. She had her students create gifts of verbs. So they were learning about verbs. So Molly and Tyler did drinking, and instead of the exact template I did, she had them just write two sentences with that verb, and then they acted it out. And they get to see themselves moving and actually drinking, or Sarah's is jumping, and she has two sentences. A teacher at my school, Kristen Squires, she had her students create gifts of their previous words of the week as one of their stations in her blended learning um, classroom. She had station rotation. And so Kristen actually had students go back and pick a word off their word wall that, word wall that was a word of the week, and they were able to create a GIF. And it was in a shared slide, so all the kids could see all of the different words created. Another cool way to make a GIF is with talltweets.com. The way that you do a tall tweet is you actually create a Google Slides deck. I created one with these three slides. So my first slide says Revolve. The second slide is an image that kind of shows what Revolve means. And then the third has a definition or um, something I want them to know. The Earth revolves around the sun. When I go to talltweets.com, I can connect to my Google Drive account and tell it, I want you to turn this slide deck into a GIF. And what it does is it takes those three, and it gives me some options, too. I can say, I want that first slide to last for three seconds, or each slide to last for three seconds, or I can make it longer or shorter. Um, and then on this next slide, if you were on my presentation, you would see it's actually moving. So it turned it into a GIF. Here, um, we've just got still images, but you can check that out. I love tall tweets for students to make some animated things like that that they could share, kind of um, animated flashcards, if you will. But you could also have them animate something by having something move, like stop motion animation. So they could have that, um, if I go back a slide here, if I had that rotation, I mean that revolve, if I had that move, move, move slightly on each slide and then connect them, then students could actually see that concept moving. Or as I said before with that example of um, having students act out an eclipse, they could show it um, on a tall tweet also, rather than acting it out with their actual physical bodies, they could show it and make a little animation. So this is kind of a neat way to make a GIF as well. Next up, I want to talk to you guys about memes. If you're not sure what a meme is, I have an example right there. It says, what if I told you that this is a meme? That's all it is. It's usually a picture that's popular um, from pop culture with added text at the top and the bottom, and they spread rapidly on the internet. Some memes are not actually even famous people. It could just be a picture that somehow has gotten popular because it's shared so much that people think it's funny. So someone might be making a funny face, or it's a school picture that's funny for some reason, and then they just get shared and spread. Your students will know what these are if you don't. And so um, one of my amazing teachers at Alt Elementary, we have um, built into our school day, we have a team meeting every Monday that's about 25 minutes long with our homeroom classes. And so one of our teachers in that class meeting decided to give each student one uh, had a picture of a grumpy cat, and she had them make a meme that reinforced a school rule. They got to pick the rule, they got to make it funny or not funny, just whatever they wanted, but it needed to reinforce a school rule. And then they shared them with each other, just as a way to reinforce the rules mid-year. I loved it, and when she shared it with me, I told her, oh my god, this meme generator is awesome, and I sent her a meme as a joke. But then she said, I'd love to do this and give them more choices than just one image, but I'm not sure how to do it. So I had a brainstorm, and I made this template, which you can absolutely grab. It's in the live binder, and you can see um, on my website a blog post all about how to do it. But in this, it's a Google drawing, and in the center I've given an example that the kitty cat is saying, Rawr! no meowing in the hallways, school day silence, because we have a rule at all, our school that it's school day silence in the hallways. Before school and after school, walking to and from class, it's okay to chat. But during the school day, it's school day silence. We are an open concept school, which means that we don't have doors on all our classrooms. They're open. And so we want to keep that silence so we don't interrupt classrooms. On the side of the template, in the space that's off the canvas, you can see on the left-hand side, I've given the students instructions of exactly what to do. And then on the right-hand side, I've got a bunch of different safe for school images that students might like to use different emotions that they can use to express their idea in the form of a meme. So you could use this for so many different things. You could 
express a character's feelings in a book. You could use geometry in real life, like this example, where it says the most delicious parallel lines ever. So if you're a math teacher or you teach geometry specifically, you could change out those images that I have on the side and pick a bunch of images and have students talk about the angles or the shapes. Um, you could have a scientific process. For example, you could put, a student could choose a tree, and then at the top it could talk about a tree takes in carbon dioxide and a tree turns it into oxygen. So they could explain something, but in that meme form that kids are clinging to and really like. They could make comments on a historical image. Really, you could comment on any topic as long as you could put your images on one side and then um, students can pick from those safe images. Um, I see on the side here someone asking, Meredith, where do you find your images? I used a Google search and I just made sure I used in the tools section of a Google search, I made sure that they were safe for reuse, that I was allowed, allowed to reuse them because um, so, I don't want to violate any copyright. So I love this idea that I actually found on Twitter. Emily Guthrie on Twitter said, Friday fun, making great Gatsby memes as a writing hook. Um, and she got the idea off of the GT Tribe podcast. If you don't listen, you should. Um, but she has, if, you, if I had zoomed in on that a little bit more, you could see the student made a meme on one side of how, is, how one of the characters is feeling. And then on the left-hand side, she had the student expand on why they did that meme. And, and they had to provide some text evidence of why they are how they know that the character is feeling that way. So I super love that idea of having students not only create the meme, but then expand on it and share how do you know that, why do you know that, and give more information about that. So that's another way students can create something fun to show their knowledge. All right, next up is comics. You can have students create comic strips to demonstrate learning right in Google Slides or Google Drawings. So here's one. I actually went to TexGoo last year. I had never been before. And if you are in Texas, or even if you're not, it is worth the trip. It was amazing. I sat in Matt Miller's session at TexGoo, and this is what I made as I was sitting there. He said, you can make, it's so easy to make them. All you have to do is go to insert image camera. You snap a picture, add text bubbles, and you've got yourself a comic strip. So as I was sitting in his session, I did it. And here I wrote, I'm in Matt Miller's session at TexGoo 17. I wonder if I'll learn anything new. Make your own comic strips incredible. And then I stuck my, my bitmoji in and said, mind blown. So I've got the directions right there. It seriously is that easy to make one. Later that day, I showed my five-year-old, Madison, and said, I just kind of explained it, showed mine, walked away. And when I came back, she had made this one. Where is my brother? Look, 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 I found him. So you can see hers doesn't line up exactly right. She's five. Does it make the point? Absolutely. So if my five-year-old can do it, I know that your students can do this. Um, I saw this social studies example on Twitter that I loved. Uh, you could have students find a picture of a historical figure, and you, you can have them add word bubbles to show what they're thinking. So in this example, it's Henry Ford talking to his wife about something they actually learned in class. Henry Ford says, um, why are we losing so many workers so fast? And his wife says, I told you we should have had those Friday night dance parties, which actually that did happen in history, that she suggested they have Friday night dance parties, and they didn't. Um, some other ideas is students could describe a character trait, provide that text evidence. You could have students annotate over a picture, as I just showed, or even define vocab terms um, with that picture being the one that is say, having the speech bubble coming out, so it doesn't have to be a picture of themselves. If you do want to do pictures of themselves and just kind of make it look really cool, here are some templates that I came up with after my daughter and I made those. Um, this way, it's got directions in there for them. So right over that gray box, it says, add your picture here. Click insert image, take a snapshot. So it takes the students through it. And I've already got kind of the cool comic book type font. Shows the students where to put their title, how to add the text boxes. Um, if you're interested in grabbing that, it is on my website. And I actually have, I believe, a video tutorial taking you or your students through how to do that. Another way that we can have students show their learning is through a learning playlist. And instead of us creating them, why not have students take on that role of teacher and create playlists of learning for each other? Um, I actually just shared this on Twitter, and it's gotten a big response. So let me explain it. Have you ever been a part of doing a jigsaw strategy? Have you done that in your class or even as a student? I remember as a student in high school, I had one teacher in particular that had us do jigsaw a lot. And here's how that goes. It's where you kind of divide up the class until about, into about four different 
groups. So person number one learns about one topic, person number two reads an article about another topic, person number three reads a textbook about another topic, and so on. Then, after each of us have learned, we come back together with one person from each group, so each group has a one, a two, a three, and a four, and we teach each other the concepts. I have to say, as a high school student, I really loved this because a lot of times it was, um, reading different sections of the textbook, and so I loved it because I thought, great, I can read only one-fourth of what I would have had to if I had to do it all myself. So I only have to read one-fourth, take really good notes, and then my, my other three friends are going to help me out, and I don't have to read the boring textbook. So that's why I liked it personally. Little did I know all of the thought behind it. Um, William Glasser's research, William Glasser's research shows us that we learn 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see and hear, 70% of what we discuss, 80% of what we experience, and 95% of what we teach to others. So this is why, as teachers, we know these t minute details of things we taught years ago, because once we teach it, it really becomes ingrained in us. Little did I know in high school that my teacher was doing me a great service doing that jigsaw strategy, because not only did I learn 95% of what I taught to my group of four, but look right there, 70% of what I discussed. So when those other members of my team were teaching me, and I'm asking questions, and we're discussing it back and forth, I'm learning a lot more than had I just read. 10%, I would only retain 10%. This is huge. So I wanted to kind of take that up a notch with our new, all of this access that we have to technology. And in our district, we're really focusing on a blended learning approach. And so teachers are making lots of learning playlists for students. But I thought, what if students made learning playlists for each other? So um, I made a template where first I made the students an example following the template so that they could kind of get an idea of what I'm looking for, and then ask the students to create one for their classmates, kind of in that jigsaw style. So here's my example. <clears throat> I have Meredith Aker's learning playlist about types of animals. I have a video for them to kind of get an overview of types of animals. And then I have three boxes in the middle here. Read, check out this website to see the six main characteristic, I'm sorry, categories animals are divided into and characteristics of each. Then I have a quiz. Enter this game code at quizzes to self-assess and see how much you've learned so far. Then I have create. Create either a short selfie video with webcamera.io or a Google drawing telling two differences between two types of animals. So example, two differences between reptiles and fish. Then I have included a graphic. So I've got a graphic showing the five different main categories, reptiles, fish, amphibians, birds, and mammals. And then at the bottom, I tell them, post your completed product under the correct shelf at this class Padlet. If you haven't seen Padlet or haven't seen it lately, you should know there's been a lot of updates lately. And one of the updates I like is that um, Padlet allows you to make kind of like shelves. So on that class Padlet, I've got um, a shelf for um, types of animals, all the categories, and then I've got one for reptiles, fish, amphibians, mammals, birds, each group, so that students can kind of file their class product under the right one. So once they've done something on reptiles, they can stick it under the reptile shelf, and all of the students can see each, each other's work about reptiles, each other's work about amphibians, and so on. So once students have gone through my example, then the next thing they would do is using this template, they would create one for the other students in their class. So using that same jigsaw strategy that I was just talking about and sharing about how William Glasser has so much research that supports it, what students would do is follow the directions outside the canvas in yellow, and it says step one, change your name and your topic in the title. So let's say I have divided my class into five, and I tell one group that they're the reptile group. I would change it to my name's learning playlist about reptiles. Then it says step two, follow the directions in each of the boxes to select tasks to help your classmates learn about your topic. Delete the words in each of the boxes to replace them with your learning task. So basically, the students are being directed by me on how to be a teacher, how to set up a learning playlist. So here on the first blue box, it says, select an article from one of these teacher-provided websites for your classmates to read. Copy the URL, delete the words in this box, and change it to tell 
them to read your selected article. So there, this is not a clickable link, but you'll be able to click it on um, my presentation in the live binder that Peg has shared. But if you clicked on that, then the students would be taken to a list of, here's a bunch of different websites about each of those, about reptiles, amphibians, that I've curated as the teacher, but I'm telling them, just select one. So they're going to become the learning expert on reptiles still, just like in a um, traditional jigsaw strategy, because they're going to read more than one. They'll probably won't read it fully, but they're going to definitely, um, <clears throat> excuse me, scan over those and decide which one do they think their classmates would benefit most from, would find most engaging, and they're going to put that there. Then in that second box, it says create a 10-question quiz in Google Forms or quizzes. Of course, you could change that, alter that for your students to be what you think would be best for them. I actually already saw a teacher use this and share it with me on um, Twitter, and they just had their students put two questions right there in the second box as a self-check. So that's just as easy. And then in the third box, it says, ask your classmates to create a product. Um, so you could give them directions for how, how you want them to make a product. Then in the top corner, that's a square where I had my video on my example. It says, choose a video from this teacher provided list that you think will hook your classmates and interest them in your topic. So I created, just on YouTube, I created a playlist of videos that I had kind of proofed as the teacher of a bunch of different videos that apply to this topic that they can choose and put in there to hook their classmates. Then underneath, I say, make sure you add a graphic, just like on my teacher example. And then finally, add your product that you create to the class padlet. So students are going to create this. And then over here um, in step three, if they have time, this is kind of an extension, in that step three yellow box, it says, change the fonts, colors, and layout of the learning menu to make it look awesome. And then step four says, delete all the yellow boxes outside of the canvas to indicate to your teacher and your classmates that your learning playlist is ready. So I love this idea. It's got lots of opportunities for students to kind of be the authors of their own learning and help their classmates learn. I think they will pick videos that hook their classmates better than I would because they are actual students. They know what's exciting. And I think that students would really benefit. And I think it would up their quality level because when they know their audience, and I'm going to talk about this more later, but if it's just for me, the teacher, they're probably going to give eh, what they think they can give to get by. But if they know it's for their classmates or if they know it's going to be for a global audience, they're going to give a lot more. So I love this idea just because I think students will up their game knowing their classmates are going to see this. They're going to want to make it high quality. Here's some ideas for implementation. You could use this for a blended learning classroom, for station rotation work. They might work on this for a week, um, depending on your level and what kinds of activities you ask them to include. It could be an extension for your GT students or students that finish early, you could ask them to create a learning playlist for something you're going to cover in a month or so. And then they've got something set up and ready, and they're excited to share with their classmates. I created this learning playlist for our class when I was finished. So that could be definitely an extension. Next up, I want to tell you guys about an awesome add-on for Google Docs called Story Speaker. You can have students create interactive stories that you can play with your voice. I know when we did um, earlier, we did a little um, poll asking who has done um, choose your own adventure stories. And several of you said, yeah, I've heard of that, haven't done it. This is kind of like a choose your own adventure story, but you actually play it with your voice. So it's voice activated. So it is an add-on for Google Docs. Um, once you add it on, by going in through Google Docs, you'll go to add-ons and then search for the story speaker. And you can, it provides you, the story speaker add-on provides you with two choose your own adventure type story templates. But what's cool is, once you have filled in their template, you can export it with one click, and the, the add-on has a pop-up menu that pops up on the right-hand side of your Google Docs screen. Um, it has just a one click, here's how you export it to your Google Home, and you can actually have your Google Home play your story for you. So the words that I wrote, Google Home will say out loud, and just like in a choose your own adventure, if I say go right, it gives me what happens when you go right in the forest, as opposed to if I say go left, it will respond with what I told it to say if I chose go left. So just like that choose your own adventure, if you'd like to see an example of that, you can go to my blog, and I know that um, Peggy George just shared that um, story speaker add-on blog post, and I've got videos of what this looks like, so you can see a little bit more in depth. My daughter actually playing with the Google Home. Um, 
But if you don't have a Google Home in your classroom, this is actually not a problem. You can play your story in what they call chat preview right from your computer or Chromebook. I actually had a student create one of the Choose Your Own Adventure stories um, one day at my school. It was an extension activity for him. And um, we, I brought my Google Home to try it out, but it didn't work in my district. I even called our IT department, and they were like, no, we're not feeling good about that yet in our district to let that happen. But you can actually choose if you see right here um, where it says get started on the right hand side and then next to that there's a second tab that says play your story. Um, the first button that's going to come up is to play it on Google Home but if you scroll down then you can choose play your story right there and Google Docs will just start talking out loud and reading your story and you can interact with it um, and just speak back, go left or your name, or different things that it asks you in the story, and it's interactive, and it'll say your name back to you. It is awesome and so fun. So here's some ideas for implementation for this. Um, you can use the template provided. They're super fun and addictive and have great fun for creative writing. You can have students work specific vocab terms into the story. So if you are not a writing teacher, but maybe you're a math or a science or social studies, you could have them work in, like, OK, you, you can create a super fun, silly, choose your own adventure story in the forest with a dragon, as long as you work in these specific vocab terms um, correctly, right? You can include character descriptions. You can add your own content expectation into that choose your own adventure type template. But as I was even coming up with these ideas, I thought, you know what? This makes me want to have like a game show. And so I created a story speaker template. It is a five question quiz show template that students can create the questions and, and answers for a quiz show. I, I named it Brain Bender. And I made it really, really simple. Um, you can easily plug in the areas that are highlighted in yellow. I'm going to go to the next slide here. Oh, before I do, I see a question. Peg says, in my templates, would you group the text boxes so they don't move? Ah, oh, I'm gonna have to try that. I'm not sure. Let me let me work on that. I'll have to see what you mean later. Maybe we can talk. You can tell me what you mean. So for Brain Bender, um, I've had several students at my school create Brain Bender quizzes, and then there's the thing that makes me excited is they are so excited to show their teacher, to show me, their assistant principal, to show other students like play my game show because they can add in silly things, they can add in fun, and they're proud of themselves that wow, the teacher. I mean, uh, the computer actually says what they typed in, and you need no coding to do it. So it's pretty cool. OK, the next one that I want to share with you guys about is some ideas on using video to have students demonstrate their learning. So eight years ago, I was teaching second grade math and science, and we did a weekly class podcast with my second graders, and they created all the videos. I would have them create videos, and then I would edit them together for them. They loved it. They felt like stars. They knew they had an audience, because I posted them at the time to TeacherTube, and um, it was really fun. They had a good time. They knew they had an audience because on TeacherTube we would get comments. Teachers wrote to me and said that they loved seeing students explaining these concepts. And they also, we sent them out to their parents every week. I loaded them onto our class iPods. And so they, they also had a station in my class where they got to watch the previous episodes and reflect on them. So they loved this. They felt like stars. They knew they had an audience, which made them do high quality work. Um, so here's some tools for recording video. You could record video directly into Google Drive nowadays. Back then, I used a flip camera, which they don't even make those anymore. But um, now, I could, and I, I used, I didn't know if everybody knew about this. If you go in Google Drive and you go to New, and then scroll down to More, there's actually an option at the bottom of More for Video Recorder. Um, it's kind of hidden there. So if you do have Google Apps for Education, you can actually just have students record right from their webcam, from a Chromebook, from a laptop, directly into their Google Drive and share it with you. If you don't have Google Apps for Education, you can also use webcamera.io. That is the website. And it is just a free web recording tool so they can record themselves. You can use Screencastify. You can also use Adobe Spark Video. If you've never used this, it is free. And they're about to open it up for students under 13. I believe in April that's going to open up. So if you have students under 13, you might need to wait till April. Um, but Adobe Spark Video is a really cool way to make video. Um, you can use actual images of the students, of video of the students' faces. But they can also just type in words and use the free icons that they have and use their voice 
to voice over. And it's very fast. I'm able to make Adobe Spark videos very quickly within 10, 15 minutes. I can put one together to explain a concept or um, like publicize a book study I'm going to do or something at my school. Another oldie but a goodie is Blabberize. This is where you take a picture. So let's say I take a picture of Henry Ford, and I tell Blabberize this is where Henry Ford's mouth is, and then I can record my voice, and it'll make the voice, the mouth of Henry Ford's picture go up and down. So then I can speak as Henry Ford to say my message, or I could speak as a mollusk if I had done some research on mollusks. Um, you can also use Chatterpix on an iOS or Android device. So these are cool ways to have students tell what they know rather than a boring old book report the same old way. They could do a blabberize and have one of the main characters tell about the book from a first person. Or they could do a web camera I.O. to explain their answer rather than um, a worksheet. So remember at the beginning I talked about how can this save us time because we know we want students to create, but we still need to know they know the content first. But just replace that worksheet with one of these creative tools. Um, at my school this year, we started something new called the Learn It, Lead It Video Creation Challenge. This is totally an extra thing that we put out there to students, and we feature a student almost every day. So we just told students, hey, if you have learned something so well that you can explain it, send in a video to Ms. Akers, and we will post it to our social media channels. We told them all, you will become rich and famous because they earn a bunch of our superstars, which is our school cash, and they get to be famous because they're on our alt Twitter page and our alt Facebook page and they love that. And they also, in their class meetings, we're playing them in our um, class meetings. They have to be about a minute long. So that way we don't have really long videos and we don't have super short ones where we're not really sure what the concept is. Our students are doing a great job leading their learning by making a short video. They're doing this at home. We've had some, most of them are just done by their parents' phones, but sometimes we've had students use iMovie, use other things. It is so fun to see the students being excited to lead others in learning. So this is another way that you can include video as a creation tool. Okay, here's another one, voice. We can have students demonstrate learning by creating a voice recording. So here's one thing you can use. You can, they can express their knowledge with Vocaroo. If you haven't heard of this, um, this is, it's just a website where students can record little short snippets, and you can easily add a QR code. So I like this idea of possibly having students maybe create a question, and you could post those questions around the room with a QR code, and students could actually listen to their classmates' voice of the question as a review rather than just a written review something different. Um, you can also do this in Padlet. Padlet, I told you earlier, I'm loving all their updates. Padlet now allows for voice responses. So um, instead of just typing the answer, you can actually click the little plus sign, and there's a bunch of ways, including video and voice, that students could record their own review questions. And maybe you could challenge them to record in their best of the game show voices. So that could be fun, that they could go up and hear their classmates saying, you know, So sorry, Meredith just lost her connection, so I'm sure she'll be right back in. I'll give her moderator privileges again. There you go, Meredith. All right, I'm so sorry about that. Did you guys hear me already sharing about Anchor? I love Anchor. No, start with Anchor. Okay, so Anchor is a really cool tool. You can go to anchor.fm, or you can also download it on either a... Um, Android or iOS device, and Anchor lets you create a podcast. Now, this is for students that are 13 or older, so I would suggest if, you're, if you have younger students to create a class podcast with this, because then you can use your teacher account. Um, and here are some ideas for podcast segments. You could have a student, and it's I, I'm, I'm going back on myself because I'm getting too excited about it. I haven't used this yet with students, but I'm so excited about it because you can literally just click a button and have them record straight to your phone or on a Chromebook. So you could have students 
you know, call on one student to come over in a station and explain a topic that you're learning about. You could have another student, um, you could have a segment where a student gives a random fact related to that. You know students would love giving a random fact. You could have a guest interview. So if you know of someone who has some knowledge about that, or maybe if one of your students' parents has some knowledge about that topic, you could have students in, in share an inspiring quote. Um, students could share a book review. You could share related current events. And the thing that's awesome about Anchor is it's like it, sh it um, saves each of those as kind of like a little bubble that then you can drag and drop around. And it has included, for free, transition music. So you can really make it sound amazing that you can just kind of click and drag in. OK, I'm going to have my topic explanation. Then I'm going to move this cool music in between the topic explanation and my random fact. And then I'm going to have this awesome outro music, the end. And it's all free and talking about that awesome um, sharing of the audience, when a, when a student knows that their audience is beyond just their teacher, I think they really amp up their level of quality. In the Anchor app, it lets you share to iTunes, Stitcher, all those awesome podcasting sites with one click. It is so easy. So they can share with their parents, their families, but they can also be proud that like this is going out to a global audience. So other students that are learning about this topic, they may listen and benefit from this. And I think you can really get buy-in from that. So I don't know if you can drop the podcast into a Google Classroom. I see that question. But I'm sure you could add the link to the Google Classroom for certain. Because I know I have shared podcasts on my um, staff's Google Classroom. So great question. Next up, I want to talk about creating an ebook. I know we have students write all the time. Um, but did you know that you could use Google Slides really easily to create an ebook? And this is one of those ways that you can up that um, audience. Here's what I mean. Just to set up slides as an ebook, you can go to File, Page Setup, Custom. And ebooks are typically 6 by 9 or 7 by 10 inches. So then if you just change that custom page setup to 6 by 9 or 7 by 10, then after the student writes their work, you can include pictures, uh, uh, about the author page, whatever they want to include, they can go to File, Download as PDF. And then that can be sent to any device and read on any device. In fact, if you, um, when you get a PDF, if you read it on your Kindle app on any device, um, Kindle will actually say, do you want to change this to Kindle format? And you can say, yes. And then I can do all the amazing things that Kindle lets you do, like highlight the text, have it read aloud to me, um, add bookmarks, add notes. So for students, how powerful would this be if you told them ahead of time, hey, this writing that we're about to do, we're actually going to put all of our books up on a class online bookshelf. We're going to advertise these. We're going to market our books. Um, we're going to teach. That way you could teach the students about marketing, sharing, getting the word out about their books, really up that global audience. And you could even track downloads so that students could get excited about, wow, other people are reading my work. I feel like this is such a cool way to up that global audience for students. So speaking of that, I just want to take a minute to say students tend to give just enough for their teachers, don't you think? And higher quality when they know it will be seen by their classmates. And then I believe their best quality effort is when they know their work is for a real global audience. So I want to encourage you, any time that you are assigning students to create something, think about how could I take this up a notch, either let it not just be for me, the teacher, but let it be for other students to see as well. Or in the most ideal situations, how could I make this a global audience? How could I get them to share this so that they will be proud of their work and try to put out high quality work for others? Also, something to try to think about is once you've introduced two or more creation tools, you might try giving students open-ended questions in which they can respond by creating what they want, as long as they've covered the content you required. So for example, if you've taught about using memes, and then you've also taught about recording with a voice answer on Vocaroo, then you might give a rubric where you say, I need you to cover and make sure you answer these three questions. And you could do a meme or a Vocaroo. Which, or you know, if it, if it needs to be three memes to cover my three questions, that's fine. Whatever you want to do. Because then students will take more ownership of, oh, I really like making memes. I'm going to make three memes. But if a student really, really loves doing um, a voice recording, they might prefer to do that and use their best you know, game show host voice. Because I know my daughter loves to make recordings of herself. She's, she's six now. But she loves to pretend she is like, on a cooking show and pretend that she's the one giving the instructions. So I could see if she had that choice in her classroom, she would always want to do a voice recording or a video. So I think 
having that buy-in by providing choice. I don't think it has to be make anything you want all the time. That's a little bit scary to me. I think there is a place for that as maybe some culminating after toward the end of the year when you know you've taught several different ways that they could create. But I think after you've taught two or three, give them a choice of two that you think would be appropriate. So I would love some feedback from you. I know I have not seen all the chat, so I know in just a few minutes we are going to have a Q&A session. So right now, if I went too fast, if I said something that you wanted more information on, right now, write a question in there. What do you want to hear more about? What was something new you learned? What was something that maybe um, really perked your interest? Write some questions right now so that when we get to the Q&A in a couple of seconds, I can be sure and address those questions. Finally, while you're writing those in, here, there are some additional resources available at my website, MeredithAkers.com. These are just, um, just so you know, all of the templates and blog posts that I, re I referred to, every template that I shared, it is available to you for free at my website. Also, um, you can access some other things that I didn't mention today, but they're kind of related, like how to virtually duplicate yourself so that you can be available to more students. Um, I also have something about, it's called a window into, and it's a Google Drawings template that you can use to create learning playlists for students. Five easy strategies to get students collaborating. So if you're interested in getting your students collaborating more, I have some really easy strategies you can use. And I also have a new twist on the positive note that really saves me time, and students really love getting those positive notes using Boxer. So that is my presentation. I hope you got some new ideas today. Create, not just consume for students. Some ideas for having them create and be excited about it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Meredith. I did capture some questions that you didn't answer. Great. <clears throat> OK, I see. Should I just look over in the uh, chat here on the moderator side? Uh, yeah. That that would be good. Yes, that's where I posted them. Okay, great. Uh, do you want to read them to me or do you want me to just read them out loud? You can go ahead and read them and, and answer them if you want to. Okay. I and see I'll catch that. others. Okay, great. Sounds good. I see, Meredith, where do you find your images? And I think I answered that, but just to answer about on my um, slides, because I know someone had commented that uh, my graphics are really nice. Thank you. Um, I get a lot of my graphics from Flat Icon. Dot com And Flat Icon, um, as long as you give credit, you can use all their icons for free. Or you can pay, and then you don't have to give credit. Um, what I love about their icons is you can kind of find a style you like and find several that go with that same style. So you might have noticed that my graphics kind of all matched. But also, you can edit the colors. So I found a color scheme that I wanted to go with for today's presentation. And then I was able to click on each of the flat icon images that I chose. And they were like mostly greens and blues. And I changed them to be my pink, yellow, and blue that I use a lot. So I use flat icon a lot as well to make my slides look really good. Um, I see, have you made a rubric for designing their own learning playlist? That's a great question. I have not created a rubric yet, and I think that's a great idea. I also think it would be great to have a peer rubric along with that, so maybe have peers have kind of a little say in that as well, but I haven't created one yet. Um, I see, can you drop the podcast into a Google Classroom? You can definitely drop the link in so that they can um, access that link for sure. I see that Paula asked, which tool do you find students currently enjoy using the most? Um, I find that my students love to make gifts. That has been really popular, the making of gifts. And I find teachers at my school trying to find other ways to use it because the students really enjoy making the gifts and sharing them and seeing each other's because it just makes them giggle. And when we're having fun when we're learning, that is a happy learning environment. So I love that. And then also, um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. What was I going to say? You said, what was the question again? What tool do you find students currently? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I need to go back and look at everything I shared. Can I go back real quick? Because it just left my brain. Oh, I remember Story Speaker. I've got some students that are real, students and teachers that are really excited about Story Speaker right now, that add-on, and having students create those Choose Your Own Adventure or the quiz show. I really have more that are enjoying that quiz show as well. Okay, 
let's see, what else do we have here? Did someone already ask us, what devices do your students have? So on my, at my school, I work in Cypress Fairbanks ISD, and at all the elementary schools, we're a pretty huge district. We have about 54 elementary schools alone. Um, and, so, and, and we have middle schools and high schools, too. I just don't know the numbers on that. I think we have 13 high schools. I don't remember how many middle schools. So it's a really big district. Um, and at all of our elementary schools, each classroom has seven Chromebooks per classroom. So not class sets, we are not one to one, but we have seven Chromebooks. Each teacher has a laptop. We, each teacher has a Promethean board, which is kind of like a smart board, except it's a huge touchscreen TV. So there's not a, um, we used to have smart boards where you had that projector that projected onto the smart board, but we no longer have the projector. Um, it's just like a big touchscreen TV, which is really nice. We don't have to worry about moving the projector. So we love those. Um, and so a lot of times our teachers are using station rotations for st getting students on technology because we are not one-to-one. -one. Um, but we're okay with that. We, I don't think one-to-one -one is necessary for great technology instruction. Do I have a podcast? Let me see what this is. Sorry. Do you have a podcast, Meredith? You are so excited about your ideas. Oh, you are so sweet. I do not have a podcast. I think that would be something fun. And so I appreciate that encouragement. And then I see Peggy George asked, can you say more about Meme Buddy Chat? Absolutely. I didn't even mention it. I know I wrote it in my slide notes. So memebuddy.chat is the website, or you can also so access it if you download on either an Android or a iOS device. If you download the Google Assistant, you can um, access Meme Buddy in Google Assistant by just saying like um, "load Meme Buddy" or "let me talk to Meme Buddy." <laughs> but if you're on Chromebooks like with kiddos, you could go to memebuddy.chat, and you can actually just with your voice create a meme. So it's hilarious. You can say, um, "Find me a picture of a dog jumping up." And it'll find you a picture of a dog jumping up. And you can say, OK, and right at the top, right, um, classroom 2.0 makes me so happy. I jump up and dance. And it'll create that meme for you. So that's super fun. You can do it literally with your voice and then share that meme. So that's kind of fun. And then I see another one here. I missed the name of the podcast that you said you listen to and get ideas from. It is called the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. And you can also check out hashtag GT, GT Tribe, hashtag GT Tribe on Twitter to, to get ideas all the time from the Google Teacher Tribe. But I love that podcast. I definitely recommend listening to it. So it's the Google no, Teacher I think Tribe you, podcast. You've answered them all, Mary. Uh, Lori, so any much. other questions oh, that I missed? Actually, Peg does have another question. What other podcasts do you follow? Oh, okay. I love to listen to Cult of Pedagogy, which is by Jennifer Gonzalez, so that's a great one. I also listen to the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast. Um, that's by Cool Cat Teacher, and that's a great one. Um, it's short. I love to listen to, actually, Matt Miller just started a new podcast that's only five minutes long. So if you're looking mm -hmm. for short ones, if you have a short commute to work, you could do the 10-Minute Teacher or Matt Miller's Ditch That Textbook podcast. That one is only five minutes or less. It's super short. And it's, it's great. He just gives an idea a day. Super short. Um, another one that I listen to, this one's just for fun. It is not educational. It's just for fun. It's called Ask Me Another. It's from NPR. And it is um, just a nerdy quiz show. And I love it. They'll, they'll, um, they'll quiz, quiz each other on anagrams and um, just funny things. And it makes me laugh. And I think you would enjoy it. Um, and let me say, one more that I really like is the TED Radio Hour. This is where they take um, three or four TED Talks on um, a specific topic, and it is not a video podcast, it is only audio, and they take some audio from it and kind of stitch them together. So one I was listening to recently was about emotions, and they take like the best ideas from three or four um, TED Talks and then discuss those. So that's a really good one too. It's also from NPR. Again, those the are the, the questions that I was able to capture. Thanks okay. so much. We'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to turn the mic over to... Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Well, thank you so much, Meredith. Uh, my head is spinning, but with 
so much excitement about all of these great ideas you shared. And it, I love that it's so much more than a tool, but the ways that you use the tool. And you gave us so many great suggestions for that. So thank you for sharing with us. And we do have some great shows coming up. So join us every Saturday, same time, if you can. Next week, we're going to have a featured teacher. And Paula Fellinger is a second grade teacher who has some terrific things going on with her students. On March 31st, we won't have a show that weekend because that is Easter weekend in the United States. And I also learned yesterday that April Fool's Day falls that weekend. So Easter and April Fool's Day coincide with each other this year. April 7th, Sarah Malchow is going to do a great presentation on tons of ways to co collaborate globally online. And April 14th, we're going to have a really great um, presentation that's a little bit different by Pooja Argawal. And it's about the brain and memory and how we can capture students' memory and get them using more of it. So it's all about the science of learning. And she has some really practical teaching strategies to share for that. April 21st, Jennifer Regruth, a fourth grade teacher, is going to be our April featured teacher. And April 28th, you heard Matt Miller's name mentioned a couple of times today. He is going to come and talk to us about 10 things we can ditch in education and what to do instead. So he won't leave us hanging, but he has some great suggestions for us. So I hope you come back and join us every Saturday that you can. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where as long as your session is open to the public, you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room, and it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site or from within the Live Binder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection for the recordings is on iTunes U. And there's also a YouTube channel, so you can subscribe on YouTube. As you exit the session, the survey should open up in your browser. You can go directly from the chat box or take the link from within the live binder as well. At the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And thanks to Patty Ruffing, who sends these out, they also will print with your name on them. Please, so when you put in the email address for a certificate, that you use a personal email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to our special guest, Meredith Akers, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming. <laughs>